Tonight on Talking Points, President Trump handed down new tariffs on China, allegedly due to intellectual property theft from American companies. We'll predict Beijing's reaction later. Questions are rising about President Trump and the 2016 election investigation, especially now that top attorney, top attorney John Dowd has resigned. We'll break down all the controversy surrounding the investigation. In the Democratic primary in the 3rd District of Illinois ended in a victory for incumbent Dan Lipinski. Lipinski ran against a member of his own party to win. We'll have the full significance of that victory later. All that and more ahead. This is Talking Points. Breaking news we are following tonight. National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster has been fired. He will be replaced by former U.N. Ambassador and current Fox News contributor John Bolton. Good evening, I'm Mike Riccardi. And I'm Josh Carney. This move comes after weeks of speculation that McMaster was the next member of the administration to leave. Bolton is a prominent conservative voice and expected to start in April. We'll be sure to follow the story as it develops. The bill covers domestic initiatives, including building roads and combating America's opioid crisis. President Trump was supportive of the legislation, although he did tweet yesterday that some of the domestic programs were a waste of money. One of the notable increases covered in the legislation is defense. The Department of Defense will gain a top spending line of $700 billion. Another increase went to election security, with $380 million being set aside for grants. The move comes after the Senate Intelligence Committee released security recommendations to states and federal government. One notable omission in the bill was DACA. The program did not receive a fix in this week's legislation, and the future of DREAMers is currently unclear. Democrats and Republicans reportedly tried to compromise, but neither side could see eye to eye. Office of Management and Budget Director Mick Mulvaney said that Democrats, quote, refused to engage, end quote, when approached about DACA. One of the reported fixes had an option for a three-year extension of the program in exchange for three years of funding a border wall. Elsewhere on Capitol Hill, President Trump signed an order today imposing tariffs on about $60 billion worth of Chinese imports. The president says the measure will punish Beijing for the theft of American technology. Here to break down the move in China's potential response are Talking Points analysts Michael Fernari and Dan Prager. Michael and Dan, thanks so much for joining us. Now, obviously, President Trump saying that the issue here is the theft of intellectual property. Michael, can you break down exactly what that means for us? Yeah, absolutely. This is President Trump's biggest move on trade yet, and the reasoning behind this is mostly due to some of the malpractice China is engaged in on trade, most notably, as you mentioned, intellectual property, but also currency manipulation. And the big concerns here is that a lot of companies are being forced into situations where their products are exploited by some of the weak enforcement of intellectual property laws in China. And it was a pretty dramatic reaction to today's news. Dan, we saw, obviously saw the stock market fall, um, but how else is the global economy reacting? I mean, the stock market is huge. Fifth largest drop in the Dow in history, 700 point drop. I mean, people are terrified that this is going to start a trade war, and with good reason. China has reacted and said, hey, this is probably going to start a trade war. Um, pe people are really scared. Um, pretty much everywhere in the stock market, things are going down. People are worried that prices on every item will go up. Um, it, it helps a couple of people, um, a few thousand jobs in the U.S., but in the end, these imports are probably going to raise prices on a lot of consumer goods. People are worried that this might start a recession and a trade war. Well, Dan, what I find interesting, like you said, is that certain people in, of certain sectors do find the tariffs helpful for their job security. And we saw Connor Lamb, the Democrat who won in the 18th District in Pennsylvania, use that to his advantage. He was supportive of tariffs. But Dan, like you said, in the long term, it could turn into a trade war. So while this may be a current win for President Trump, how do we think it plays out in the long term for him as we move into election season? Well, Dan mentioned, just briefly to touch on this, Dan mentioned that there could be a possible trade war. And actually, five minutes before we went on, it broke that China will be retaliating with billions of dollars of tariffs on, I think, notably aluminum, steel, uh, pork, and wine. And the way that this plays out in the election, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But tariffs as an issue don't poll particularly poorly, but the problem may be for President Trump. The economy is really the only thing he has going for him right now, and if 
we get you know, some, some losses economically for, for, for the country, it may be very difficult for President Trump to sell Republicans to voters. And, and we've, we've seen a lot of things that Trump has put tariffs on, notably things steel, aluminum, coal. And a lot of these things are kind of used to help his base. Um, but in the end, really, one of the things that China has notably targeted um, and they're going to continue to target is farmers. The U.S. farm industry exports a lot to mm -hmm. China, and China is going to use that to their advantage. Right now, they hold most of the cards, and while this may pull well right now for his Trump's base and Republicans who are saying, you know, this is good because China does do mess with currency and steal intellectual property, but I think in the long run, this could have big economic implications for middle America. Well, I think it'll be interesting to see how these tariffs play in, especially with uh, World Trade Organization rules and, and how things may fare there when it comes to international organizations. But we're going to have to leave the conversation there. We'll make sure we follow Michael and Dan, thanks so much for Thank joining you. us. My pleasure. And Trump has spent the last few days launching an all-out assault on special counsel okay, Mueller and his investigation saying things like the Mueller probe should never have been started, that it is a total witch hunt, and that Mueller's team is stacked with Democrats. Let us set aside for a moment that so much of what the president says is simply factually incorrect. That was Representative Jerome Nadler of New York speaking of, Trump pre of President Trump's uh, open hostility towards special counsel Robert Mueller and his investigation with Trump's top attorney John Dowd resigning today and more evidence of Russian interference both in the U.S. and elsewhere. Focus on the investigation is heating up. Here with us to break down the situation are Talking Points analysts Connor White and Jack Watson. Guys, thank you for being here. Great thank to be you. here. So when we look at how credible the rumor is that President Trump could fire Bob Mueller. Um, what does the response? What is the response from GOP leadership? Well, we don't necessarily know how credible it is, but Trump's from uh, not Trump's tweets from President Trump over this past week seem to indicate that he is nearing it. He's been calling it a witch hunt, you know, basing it on the fake dossier, you know, as according to him, paid for by the Clintons. So he really is ramping up suspicion that he wants this to end, and that could end in the firing, and that has led to a lot of distaste from top uh, members of the GOP. We have Senator Lindsey Graham saying that this could mark the beginning of the end of his presidency. And what you know, in an administration, sorry Mike, in an administration uh -huh. near as uh, sporadic as this one has been, it's really not uh, too far-fetched to predict something like this to happen. We can really only speculate, but GOP leadership, Republicans, even top Republicans like um, Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan have said, you know, look, just let Mueller do his job, uh, cooperate with him, and let's end this thing as quickly as possible. That's been the, that's been the attitude of certain Trump l lawyers like Ty Cobb. Um, mm -hmm. And basically, uh, it, it's really, uh, to me, it's an interesting thing because the president has been so vehemently against Mueller in public, mm -hmm. uh, railing against him on his Twitter account. Account, uh, on President Trump's Twitter, Twitter yeah. account, that is, but uh, it, behind the scenes, there seems to be a bit more of a, uh, of a disagreement. Well, what I find interesting, right, is that while, yes, Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, all these top GOP leaders, they have warned President Trump not to fire Bob Mueller. They have said that they don't feel it's necessary to create a law that would protect Mueller. So I think, personally, that it could become one of these situations, right, where if Trump does fire Mueller, that the GOP has nicely placed themselves in the middle, like we warned against it, but mm -hmm. they didn't go so far as to making a law. Now, Jack, according to the Washington Post, Special Counsel Robert Mueller does want to talk with President Trump about the firing of Michael Flynn. How significant do you think that is? Well, the Flynn indictment has been the so far the only uh, indictment of a Trump administration member not a transition team member necessarily not a campaign team member but uh, a, a member of the actual administration itself and what Bob Mueller is trying to figure out here is did the president sanction Flynn's talks with Russians uh, how much did he know and was that the motivation by him uh, asking at, that at the time FBI Director James Comey to fire or to uh, to end the investigation on uh, Michael Flynn, who then resigned uh, in mid-February. So it's it's an incredibly interesting prospect because if that is true, if the president's motivation behind that was to, uh, w behind his conversation with Mueller in the Oval Office, or, or rather Comey in the Mo Oval Office, was to uh, end the investigation on Flynn because of 
uh, deals with Russia, that might be obstruction of justice. And to pivot from the investigation to the international community, we obviously had the election this past week of President Putin, and they spoke over the phone and they discussed whatever they discussed. But ultimately, what, what does that bode w in terms of the United States taking a position that the election was, was a sham? What does that exactly mean, Connor? Well, we've had a number of top Republicans, including John McCain, come out against uh, the allegations, or, or not the allegations, the fact that President Trump did in fact congratulate President Putin as opposed to, uh, we've had several reports saying that he did not condemn things like, you know, the 2016 uh, election meddling or the uh, recent nerve agent attack on a Russian spy in Great Britain. So it's really about what he didn't say as opposed to what he did say. That's what people are seeing as problematic. Exactly. Widespread criticism toward the president for saying things uh, along the lines of congratulations against the wishes of his advisors. Right. And the fact that uh, the fact that the president uh, didn't talk about not only the nerve gas, the nerve gas, supposed nerve gas attack, but uh, the fact that we're investigating their country for supposed meddling in the U.S. election, which is something that the entire intelligence community basically in the United States has agreed upon. Lots right. of developing storylines, and it's certainly something that is going to keep evolving. Thank you both. For Thank you. It. Thank you. Facebook and data analytics firm Cambridge Analytica are at the center of crisis. Cambridge Analytica collected data from more than 50 million Facebook users without their consent. This use, they use this information to individually target users in various political campaigns. Facebook faced str strong criticism for its role in the 2018 presidential election, and the recent news of data misuse has provoked a furious international response. Imagine that you are on Facebook and you like the page of your favorite clothing store. Maybe you did this by liking a page or, or taking a quiz. Maybe you did this with knowledge that advertisers would target you with products. What you probably did not know is that researchers figured out how to use this information to predict your personality traits. They could predict how introverted you are or how open-minded you are. Researchers then use this information to predict your political views, supposedly better than your spouse could. Cambridge Analytica, the firm that extracted this data, helped elect political candidates. They started by hiring a researcher named Alexander Kogan. About 270,000 Facebook users downloaded Kogan's app, which took the form of a personality quiz. Kogan collected the data from all of these users along with their Facebook friends if their privacy settings allowed it. After taking this data, the firm used it to reach voters with hyper-targeted messaging. They created psychological profiles that could be used to target voters during political campaigns. It is possible that the firm took your data without your permission and targeted you or your friends during an election period. For what it's worth though, some clients said they saw little value in the models of Cambridge Analytica. Additionally, the firm denied using psychographic modeling techniques on the Trump campaign. However, it is not clear whether the firm used the data in other ways to target voters. The number of registered voters that were targeted is also unclear. Thomas St. Hilaire, thanks so much for joining us here. Now, Alexander Kogan, like you said, was the researcher that found all of this information. Did he have Facebook's permission to do so? In a general sense, yes, because when he started taking this information, Facebook permitted it. They allowed you to not only develop apps in this way, but they allowed you to collect the data of people and their, and their friends as well. Now, granted, a lot of these policies shifted, but at the time, yes. It sounds like there's two major narratives here what went wrong and why was it able to go wrong and now who's to blame but what what is the real issue in all of this right well there are two main issues i mean if you were facebook the issue in, that they say is that well, quite frankly cambridge analytica lied because they said that they were using this information for academic research and other purposes that weren't to, to target these voters and the second thing is again this isn't a business or this isn't academic research this is data that is being extracted from users that is being used for political gains something that you know Zuckerberg really didn't envision when you know he created Facebook in a dorm room and with all that information out there Thomas between Cambridge and Analytica and Facebook why not just destroy it? <laughs> well, that's, that's something that a lot of people have called for and a lot of people have asked. They think what it comes down to is this information is already out there. I mean, Cambridge Analytica said, look, we put this information away, but the New York Times recently uncovered that there have been copies of this information. I mean, especially leading up to when they uh, changed their policies in 2015, any information before that is really out there. And there's, I mean, there's still information that's coming out. And quickly, is there any way that Facebook can just avoid all of this? 
Not quite. I mean, when you look at the, the business model of Facebook, it heavily relies on advertisers, right? right? So they can't just ban advertising altogether, whether it's you know for political purposes or, or you know other measures. I think what you are going to see is that there was a recent lawsuit, I think, that was announced today against Cambridge mm -hmm. Analytica. You might see um, maybe some legal action. Well, Thomas St. Hilaire, obviously this issue is very dense. It, it has major implications on what could happen in the 2018 elections. And even furthermore, thank you so much for joining us. Obviously, we're going to keep following this story. Thank you very much. After the break, Illinois incumbent 3rd District Representative held on to his seat. Stay tuned for how the effects of the Democratic strategy are going forward. Leaving hot coals improperly extinguished can cause a wildfire. Hey guys, it's smoking. It looks as if smoking is going to use the drown, stir, drown and feel technique. After the first drown, a good start. Next, another drink. And finally, a close feel. Is it cool? cool. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Smokey, catch. Oh, my bad, Smokey. Only you can prevent wildfires. Everybody has a dream. Mine was to see the ocean. And with a little help, I made it. They call me Maxi, but I prefer tripod. I was your above average four legged homie, and then wham, bam, minivan. Some people pity me. Now that's lame. I still run, fetch, and swim. And the ladies love me. I'm the ultimate wingman. Just don't ask me to high five. They said a bottle was just a bottle. That no one would ever notice me. But I knew I could be more. That one day, I would make people smile. Rep <coughs> Representative Dan Lipinski can hold on to his seat in Congress after narrowly winning the Democratic primary. The Illinois 3rd District incumbent had to fight a close race against a member of his own party. Talking Points political analyst Galat Malamud is here to discuss the race in the 3rd District and Democratic strategy going forward. Galat, thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I mean, such a close race. Lipinski got 51% of the vote. This is a seat he's held for over 10 years, and his father held it before him, so definitely closest primaries ever fought. Absolutely. And is this race indicative of the divide we're seeing within the Democratic Party? Yeah, it's really the Bernie wing of the party, which is was represented by the challenger Newman, versus more of the the moderate conservative Democrats, such as Lipinski, who's pro-choice and holds a more conservative, uh, you know, view on a lot of other issues. And this was so represented so well by who endorsed them. Newman had endorsements by Bernie Sanders himself and Kirsten Gillibrand, while Lipinski was backed by Nancy Pelosi, again, one of the more establishment Democrats who a lot of Democrats right now are not exactly the happiest with. And can we expect more targets from the left going forward into the 2018 midterms and so on? Right. I mean, it, it, of course, it won't be everywhere. You know, the Democratic Party doesn't want to fight itself and unseat every seat they have. Mm -hmm. But definitely in certain places, you look at California, where Senator Dianne Feinstein's held the seat for over two decades. And the California Democratic Party there is not backing her. They're opting for the more liberal up and coming state senator there. Even in New York with the governor's race, we see Cynthia Nixon calling Cuomo not a real Democrat mm -hmm. in her eyes. So again, it's that liberal Bernie Sanders wing versus more establishment candidates. And when you look at when the left side of the ticket has their candidates set, they still have to take on the Republicans. So what do the Democrats need in terms of making proactive challenges? Exactly. And I mean, it goes against what's happening in some of these primaries. But in general election, you need unity. It doesn't help if you're not voting for people of your own party or supporting them. But also, you want to look at really the Rust Belt states is what I'm looking at. There are five states that Obama won in 2012. 12 that Trump won in 2016 and if you could get people who voted for your party once to vote for you again and you do that you know by getting support from labor unions like we saw Connor Lamb 
get support from the Pennsylvania AFL-CIO in his race that he won. That was a big upset. So stuff like that, looking at labor unions, Rust Belt states, that could help them get back some of those Obama voters. And so when you're talking about getting back to those votes, and we're looking at key races moving into 2018, what are some of the key races that you're keeping your eye on in terms of the Democrats trying to win back uh, the Senate and the House? Yeah, well, when you look at the Senate, it's a little tougher because three of the Republicans that are retiring there in, you know, red states, Tennessee, mm -hmm. Utah, and Arizona. But when you look at some key House races, there are five key House races that all have something in common, and it's that they're, they're up there right now, California 39th District, California 49th, Washington 8th, New Jersey 2nd, and Florida 27th. All of those have Republicans who are now retiring. They also all voted for Obama at least once, and all of those districts, except the New Jersey one, voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016, right. and now they have Republicans leaving. So those are five key races definitely to look at for the Democrats. Five key races looking for the Democrats and certainly going to be following throughout those elections. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Gilad. Always a pleasure. Coming up, the future of Syracuse's I-81 highway has been a point of contention for over a decade. Our Mike Riccardi will outline solutions offered at a meeting at Syracuse University earlier today. Adventure can be found anywhere, but the best place to start is in the forest. I spy something beginning with S. Snow? No. Snow-covered trees? Nothing to do with snow. Head outside to discover incredible animals <laughs> and beautiful plants that come together to create an unforgettable adventure. Wow. So grab your loved ones. Don't even. And explore a world of possibilities. Come on, this way. Visit discovertheforest.org to find the closest forest or park to you. Hey, look, it's those guys. Uh, Are you good to drive? I'm fine. How many did you have? I should be fine. You should be? You go and step out of the vehicle for me. See ya, buddy. Good luck. So it turns out, buzz driving and drunk driving, they're the same thing. And it costs around $10,000. So not worth it. As parts of Interstate 81 reach the end of their full or their useful life, government officials have spent the last several years coming up with a long-term solution. After ruling out a tunnel, the New York State Department of Transportation has narrowed the search down to two options. The viaduct, with an estimated cost of $1.7 billion, and the community grid at $1.3 billion. The viaduct would be a rebuilding and a lane expansion of the current stretch of the highway through the city. The community grid would mean tearing down the current viaduct and building a boulevard-style street in its place. Now, the question of the highway begins right over here, this stretch of 81, where it meets 690 and continues past the hospital and past the University Hill. Now, if they do build the community grid option, it will go right there on Almond Street, and traffic will be redirected through 690 East and on to 481, which will be formally renamed 81. And earlier today, Mayor Ben Walsh, who supports the community grid solution, was part of the Future Infrastructures panel in Slocum Hall. Talking Points analyst Gilat Malamed had the chance to speak with him at the event. Something that was emphasized at the panel a lot was that something has to happen, right. regardless of what it is. And, you know, the Department of Transit, they started this planning in 2005. When do you think the next step will happen? What will that next step be? And what's the timeline for this getting finished? Yeah, it, the, the time frame is, uh, it, it's been hard to pin down. Uh, but what we know now with the state's most recent decision to include the tunnel option in the draft environmental impact statement, uh, they've said it's going to be at, uh, at least a year before the DEIS 
uh, is released. Uh, so, so we have that as kind of our next benchmark. And then from the DEIS, there will be a public comment period uh, before the final environmental impact statement is released. So we're still uh, at least a couple years away. Uh, but as we discussed tonight, I think uh, we're all anxious to get beyond the decision of what to do and to the, our earlier point, uh, really start to focus on how we do it, because that's what's really going to uh, have the lasting impact on the region. You can watch the full-length interview at CitrusTV.com. Josh, over to you. Thank you both. After the break, Mike and I will take a look at a story that we're anticipating. Don't go away. Did you hear about the pony with a sore throat? He was a little horse. <laughs> Can I tell you a cat joke? Just kidding. <laughs> Why couldn't the pellet wait? Why was the basketball court all wet? Why? Because a pair of cats dribbling all over it. Where do cats go on vacation? New York. <laughs> This is the story of a boy who didn't talk for a long time. The boy liked things to always be the same. Any changes would scare and upset him. The unknown was an unfriendly place. The boy was very sensitive to lights and sounds. So he built secret hiding places where they couldn't get in. The boy didn't like looking people in the eye. He wasn't trying to be mean, it just made him feel uncomfortable. Sometimes he would flap his arms again and again. One day I found out I have something called autism. My family got me help. Slowly I found my voice and learned all the ways I could live with it better. Early intervention can make a lifetime of difference. Learn the signs at autismspeaks.org. The Federal Reserve raised interest rates yesterday by a quarter of a percentage point. This is the sixth time since the financial crisis that rates have been raised. This is the first major move by the Federal Reserve under new Chairman Jerome Powell. His remarks from his first news conference today highlighted a central bank more focusing more on data and less on theoretical analysis. The response and confidence in the economy shown by Powell is promising. But I'll be looking ahead to how the economy responds to this latest move from the Fed and how Powell will move forward as chairman. So a lot of the reason and a lot that has been contributed to why the stock market is doing so well, why the economy is, is having such a, a prowess right now, is the fact that there's a lot of speculation over deregulation and making it easier mm -hmm. to do business in the U.S. But the fact that Powell has actually raised rates, and it's the sixth time it's happened since the 08 financial crisis, clearly is indicative of the fact that we're in a much more stable state. Mm -hmm. And I would say that, that that is really the message here. Well, you saw the confidence in the economy grow the second President Trump won, and then when he took office, there was a lot of confidence, and, and you saw that in the stock market and how it's been doing so far. Now, we have seen several drops due to, due to the tariffs and, and due to other things, but generally speaking, the economy has continued to grow, continued to add jobs following mm -hmm. the path that President Obama set, but something that I find interesting, Josh, is that you know a lot of economists will argue that the economy is cyclical. We mm -hmm. will be back into a recession at some point or another. And depending right. on who you ask, it may be in a much shorter period of time than we're expecting, whether it's a few years or several years. But the question becomes, right, is how high are they going to raise these interest rates right. before that happens? Because when it inevitably does, the, the height of the interest rates is going to be very important. I would say the dramatic fluctuations from the stock market that we're seeing in you know, the past several months is kind of varying as the course of the news you know, spreads itself out. But when you look at actually you know, what this kind of means, it, it does say that it, it, that it is in a better position and we are in mm -hmm. a better state and that there is no emerging bubble, that there is no emerging uh, you know, crisis. But ultimately that, that still has to be proven. So it's a very confident move, it's a very confident talk from the Fed. But really what it amounts to is, is unsure. So. Certainly a strong move by Powell. Absolutely. That's all we have for Talking Points tonight. I'm Mike Ricard. And I'm Josh Carney. Follow Citrus TV News on Facebook and Twitter and for more content. And check out CitrusTV.com slash Talking Points for all our websites and articles. And don't forget to tune in next Thursday for a brand new episode of Talking Points. Have a good night, sir.